Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Acquired Brain Injury presentation that Katie and I will be giving you today. Um, to introduce ourselves so you know our background, my name is Jess Riccardi. I um, am a, an assistant professor at the University of Maine, um, but I'm a clinically trained speech language pathologist and approach my work through that lens. And before this meeting, I was trying to calculate like what my cumulative time in the schools would have been as a speech pathologist. I have about four or five years, somewhere around there of experience. And then I'll let Katie introduce herself. Thanks, Jess, and thanks, Tammy. My name's Katie Bezier. I'm the Senior Neuro Resource Facilitator for the Brain Injury Association of America's Maine Chapter. Uh, my background is in public health and education, and I used to be a classroom teacher before I made a career change into the work that I do now. So we're here to talk to you about childhood brain injury. And from what Tammy told us is that many of you have a good background. I like to start with a little bit of background to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of terminology and what Katie and I will be referring to. And then I'm hopeful that I can walk you through some suggested pathways and opportunities or resources to best serve children with brain injury in the school system. And then Katie's going to wrap us up by talking about some specific supports and opportunities that the Brain Injury Association of America Main Chapter can help you with. So that's kind of our roadmap for today. In terms of background, when we talk about childhood brain injury, generally we use the umbrella term of acquired brain injury which meets these four different categories or definitions. It is an injury to the brain that occurred after birth. So this does not include birth trauma. Really results in a change to how the brain functions or the neuronal activity of the brain. It is not hereditary, congenital, congenital degenerative, or induced by birth trauma. And importantly, this can include both traumatic causes or non-traumatic causes. When we think specifically about children with brain injury, the most common traumatic causes are here, including falls and being struck by or against an object. Of course, we have some other components such as uh, motor vehicle accidents or uh, sports related injuries. Non-traumatic injuries can include things like meningitis, stroke, anoxia, um, toxicity, brain tumors, and encephalitis. Today, we'll walk through a couple case studies. Um, and my work largely focuses on traumatic injuries, but everything we'll talk about today can also apply to non-traumatic injuries. What you'll hear is that there's not that much research to support what we're doing in the schools. And so we oftentimes borrow any traumatic brain injury research, research to better serve these children with non-traumatic injuries. When we see children with brain injury, an overwhelming amount of the injuries are going to be considered mild in severity, while about 15% will be categorized as moderate and about 5% as severe. I present these numbers to highlight kind of the number of children we will be seeing with these concussions or mild injuries, but to also emphasize the point that severity is a measure of acute injury severity, not in the type of challenges or symptoms or longevity of those challenges that we'll see in kids. We know that a good portion of children with mild injuries and almost all of those with moderate or severe injuries will have longer term challenges that need to be met in the school system. To make sure we're on the same page, we consider that childhood is any um, child under the age of 18. And as some of you might know, our youngest age group, those zero to four year olds are actually the highest risk age group for a traumatic brain injury across the lifespan. What's important to consider when you're thinking about kids is that they do recover and develop differently than adults and also based on their age. I usually present this little schematic here to walk us through um, what we mean. Oh gosh, sorry, did that just, did the bottom of the slide get cut off when I just moved that? Can you see it all? We can see like um, the word age is half okay. about just, yeah. Okay, if it becomes a problem, I'll exit out and I'll restart. I had to move my Zoom bar, I apologize. Um, so I usually present this schematic just to demonstrate that for kids with brain injury who obviously occur their brain injury during key periods of development, we see significant challenges in development after the injury. So if you imagine that this green dotted line is what we would consider typical development, 
such that as kids age, they have a higher or increased development of skills. And I recognize this is very simplistic. Um, when a child who is on this typical development trajectory experiences a brain injury, they have a sharp decrease in functioning and then a sharp improvement. And most of the time this occurs within acute care or rehab services. But then when they return to home and school, their um, trajectory of development is slower than that of typical development, which really results in this gap between the child with a brain injury and their peers. Many times this type of image is connected to difficulties with new learning. So we know after an injury, children with a brain injury have challenges with new learning or learning ideas, concepts, and tasks that they did not have mastered before their injury. And of course, this increases challenges over time. So when we consider what areas these challenges can be for children with brain injury, um, my National Association, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, has pulled together this table along with the CDC to categorize these as cognitive, behavioral, emotional, motor, sensory, or somatic signs and symptoms. And while school nurses might not think that they have specialties in all these areas, so many times these health effects are overlapping and co-occurring. And so really the school nurses coming into play here is incredibly helpful for a true interdisciplinary team approach. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what does childhood brain injury look like in Maine? Um, I know Katie and I can both endorse that our numbers are not well collected and we are certainly working on better data collection in the state. But based on what we know about brain injury in Maine and nationally, we can expect that over 2000 children will receive medical care for a brain injury each year. And we expect that there's about 36,000 children living with a history of brain injury in the state. We have kind of two main problems here is the first that children often lack seeking or receiving acute medical care, which leads to a high underestimation and really inaccurate representation of this problem. And so I think while these numbers might seem small for the state, we expect them to be larger. And therefore, you might be coming across children that have had a brain injury but are not included in this count and don't have medical documentation of an injury. Additionally, the state of Maine, as with many states, does not have a formal system for children with brain injury. And so they might receive medical care, or if they don't, they do return to school and we don't have a clear pathway for how to serve these children. Of course, this results in high rates of unmet need and really a misidentification of need. Oftentimes these are attributed to other diagnoses outside of brain injury. So to walk you through a couple different examples today, um, I've pulled together two different cases, one being a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury and the other being moderate or severe. So we'll talk about both David and Angie throughout these um, next couple slides of the presentation. And for David, I'd like you to keep in mind a 15 year old boy who hit his head on a door between classes two weeks ago. He did go to the local urgent care and received a diagnosis of a concussion. And Angie is an eight-year-old girl who experienced a severe traumatic brain injury in a car accident when she was five. So she's about three years post-injury. She was hospitalized for two months and now receives special education services. I know these are incredibly uh, generic cases and don't have a lot of detail, but this is often what comes across my desk in terms of case study and the amount of information I receive. So hopefully it'll provide us a framework as we uh, move through some of the ideas or suggestions. So Katie and I wanted to suggest what would be, we would call an ideal pathway for children with brain injury and really think about both nurses and families as critical partners on this pathway. As I mentioned earlier, childhood brain injury really lacks scientific research to guide the things that we are doing. And so the information I'm going to present with, to you today is kind of the best of what we have for scientific evidence, but really relies on your clinical experience and expertise along with the interdisciplinary team. And then the patient values and the family values and family interactions. Um, so if we think kind of about that evidence-based practice model, um, really relying on what we think as an interdisciplinary team, including the child and the family would be best to lead us down this pathway. 
Um, so here's a, a little timeline schematic of what we could typically think about using both David and Angie as our case models here. Um, so starting on the left, when a child experiences that brain injury, usually, but not always, there is some sort of acute medical care received. So this might include a visit to the ER, to the urgent care, or this might include some level of acute medical inpatient care followed by inpatient rehabilitation. Ultimately, this kind of medical care setting only lasts for maybe two hours to maybe six months in the case of really severe injuries in children. And then we're, we have this hopefully warm handoff between the medical setting and the school setting. In this ideal pathway, regardless as to the severity of injury, that medical team would be able to communicate with at least one person, if not the entire team in the school setting, to be able to talk about where this child is at and potentially provide some advice or, um, or a timeline for how to transition this child back into the school setting. I bring up this warm handoff because in much of the work that I do, we talk about the importance of school nurses and potentially facilitating this warm handoff or at least being the person or part of the team that could um, kind of digest and share this medical information back with some community or team members who aren't as adept in understanding or interpreting medical information. Um, so if you nurses could be a part of this handoff and pulling this child back into the school system, um, I think it would certainly help that transition period. Now, as these children are back in the school system, and what I would like to highlight is really for the rest of their childhood and potentially into early adulthood, um, we can expect a couple different challenges to occur or um, scenarios to occur based on injury severity. So if we take David, who is our mild um, brain injury, he's a teenager, what we would expect is that he would engage in the return to learn process for about two to four weeks after his concussion as he re-engages with the school setting. So this includes things like um, minor or temporary accommodations within his regular education setting. We'll talk a little bit more about what this could look like and provide you some more resources to help guide this process in an upcoming slide. Meanwhile, if we consider Angie, who is that eight-year-old with the more severe injury, upon returning to school or in an ideal world right before returning to school, there would be an evaluation for and provision of special education services. Now we know that Angie's in a prime time of development and likely going to acquire skills really quickly, and she's also recovering from a brain injury. So for best practice, we hope that the team considers reassessing her at three, six, and 12 months after her return to school, and then every six months thereafter. This does not have to be a complete triennial type evaluation that individuals would do for, an, for special education, but really a check-in with the team to see has anything changed, um, has there been a change in medication that might impact Angie's ability to engage, have we seen significant growth, significant challenges, um, have the expectations changed in school, and continue to monitor her through her transition to whatever she might be pursuing in post-secondary life. So one of the questions I usually get is, when do students with brain injury need formal supports? And so I'm sure that many of you have seen a tier RTI model similar to this, up, this triangle here. Um, and what I like to drive home is that many times children with moderate to severe brain injury will need this tier three intensive support. This is again um, similar in some capacities or might be actually called the individualized education plan. I know this changes depending on what um, district you're in, but the student needs modifications to what is taught or what they're expected to learn. And so to me, the role of the school nurse can be incredibly powerful in the IEP process, particularly navigating and advocating for the child's um, physical um, health needs. This could be something like medication management, it could be related to fatigue and headache. Any of those domains that the school nurse could have a specialty in would be really important to consider as we're identifying what these modifications might look like. Now for tier one and tier two, this is for students who need accommodations for simply how they access materials. So there is not a modification to the curriculum. 
And almost all students, there are some exceptions, with concussion or mild brain injury can be successful with some minor accommodations and most often temporary accommodations. So those students with concussion would fall in here. Regardless as to what tier you're looking at, whether it's accommodations or modifications, the resource listed here, and we'll share the slide, the link to the slides at the end, um, is from the um, Center for Brain Injury Research and Training. I think is what it stands for, CBERT. Um, they have a wonderful PDF that is basically a checklist of accommodations and modifications that could be considered for kids with brain injury. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, given how many symptoms overlap or co-occur for kids with brain injury, I think the school nurses can be particularly helpful in identifying or uh, suggesting some accommodations and modifications um, that might support a child's performance in one area that ultimately would increase their productivity and success across domains. What I think is the most important thing for folks to take home is that children with brain injury need what's called continuous and regular reassessment. Again, they're developing and recovering from their injury and they're going to be encountering different academic expectations as they move through their years in school. And so their needs for accommodations or modifications might change. Um, and it's important for that interdisciplinary team to be there together to consider those things. So who exactly is involved in this interdisciplinary team? I will say that my list is not exhaustive of who might be involved, but of course we have the family, including the child, caregivers and siblings. Then we have the physicians and neuropsychologists who traditionally play a pretty um, siloed role in that medical team. So again, they might be someone who's with that child acutely for those two hours or six months um, post-injury. Um, but then they would hand off and transition that child over to the school setting. So we have those teachers, special educators, counselors, psychologists who operate almost solely in that school setting. In that transition from medical to school, we certainly have four groups that have expertise in both of those areas, that being the nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech language pathologists. Um, these four professions, I think, again, are, play a critical role in that interdisciplinary team, but particularly in that transition of children from the medical to school setting. With a successful transition, we set this child up to be successful early on and hopefully set the team up to better serve the, the child's needs as they move through school. Now, I left this last kind of column blank here as we consider community um, stakeholders or community team members. My guess is that we probably have a range of folks across the state from this on this call, or at least that will be watching the recording. Um, and something that I'm really interested about um, in children with brain injury are the community members that might step in in more rural communities that we don't traditionally consider being support members or team members in more urban settings. So things like other community leaders, recreation leaders, anyone that's in that community that would be helpful to that child should likely be involved in some capacity in talking about um, educational and school-based supports. So I'm sure some folks can consider those other, other people in their team or in their school communities. Are there any questions on the background or pathways before we get into some common challenges? Okay. Um, so the next five slides, I've outlined some common questions or statements that I usually get from school-based service providers. And I'm gonna provide some resources as well as ask some more questions back because that's generally what happens is that one question reveals more questions in childhood brain injury. So many times I hear school providers and most of my work is done with other speech language pathologists saying, well, we aren't trained in brain injury. Um, luckily for you, the network for PHL has a quote on how wonderful school nurses are in terms of really highlighting this intersection between student health and education. Um, you all have a unique expertise that you could bring to that child's educational team and really can be advocates for this side of physical and mental health um, intersecting with academic achievement. 
when I think about David's case for the teenager with a mild brain injury, many times those physical symptoms, as I had mentioned, like headache, fatigue, sleep disturbance, are some of the symptoms that last longer that prevent children from re-engaging successfully academically. And so as school nurses, being able to step in and share your expertise on how we might support David in managing those symptoms and also advocating for his return to the classroom or full return to education. While you might not know exactly what that timeline is, I think that you all can serve as great advocates. When we think about children like Angie with more severe brain injuries, we certainly see some more medical complexities. Um, as a speech pathologist, we're more likely to see challenges with feeding and swallowing, um, as well as some other cognitive challenges that might come into play. Um, and medication management that has to be managed throughout the school day. Um, I always defer to my school nurses to help me understand potentially one, when um, medication is wearing off and that child might not be in the right place to be engaging academically, but also identifying times where um, th their medical status is more stable during the day, that they could be highly engaged and highly successful. Um, and so being able to have those conversations for um, both the mild and more severe injuries is really helpful to pull that school nurse in. I put three resources here um, for those of you who are interested in having some additional training on brain injury. There is a Heads Up to Schools um, webinar and information pamphlet specific to school nurses published by the CDC. Um, I also really enjoy the Concussion Alliance. Obviously, they're focused a little bit more on mild injuries, but they do have resources specific for school nurses that I think um, are written towards your expertise and your, your knowledge and could be helpful for your practice. So challenge number two is many times we don't have medical documentation of a brain injury. Um, this is a problem that we're dealing with all the time in research, is that parents will say, yeah, my child has had a brain injury, um, but they can't find the medical records or they never received medical care. For school nurses and anyone who is on that mixed medical um, educational team, you all have the expertise to be able to screen this child for brain injury. And if there is a suspected brain injury, to refer them to a neuropsychologist or a primary care physician to secure that medical documentation. If academic challenges are present and that child does screen, screen positive for a likely brain injury, I advocate that the school team works for identification. If that child screens positive but doesn't have academic challenges, then I usually suggest that the school team document that in the child's file. Um, but not necessarily work for identification just because of how taxed our medical systems are in the state. Um, it's a really long wait to get those services. Um, and if that's not going to have an immediate impact, then I think it's okay to wait. Generally for school-based providers, I recommend the first link here, which is the help screener. It's an incredibly simple questionnaire that asks the parent um, some questions about history of brain injury. The OSU traumatic brain injury identification screener is much more thorough and intensive, but does provide a really rich interview that can be done with both the parent and the child. What I suggest is that the school team pairs either of these screeners with what's called a credible history interview. This is basically just engaging the parent or caregiver in more in-depth conversation to establish the situation in which that brain injury occurred so that you as a school team have a strong rationale as to why you would choose a brain injury identification or brain injury sensitive supports for this child. While both David and Angie's case studies, they both did have a diagnosis of a brain injury, most of the time mild injuries are not going to bring that diagnosis to you. Um, and the helpful thing about screeners is that these can be administered years after an injury. So you don't, you can certainly suspect a brain injury that occurred a long time ago and use them to capture that information. Um, the statement, third statement that I typically get is her concussion just won't go away. Um, and this is the situation where I generally start to ask more questions and where I encourage the school team to ask more questions. So the first one is, well, how long has it been? Um, many, the myth out there is still out there that concussions take two weeks to resolve. 
We know that in kids, concussions take about four weeks on average to resolve, and that is a typical time to resolution of injury symptoms. Um, so if it's only been three weeks, um, and they're making some slow progress, then I'm less concerned about persisting concussion than I am if it's been six to eight weeks. My next question is, were return to learn guidelines followed? If this child was automatically brought back into school and thrown into their normal academic routine, and they're having persistent symptoms, then I would encourage the school team to revisit the return to learn guidelines and think about how they can reduce expectations to help that child recover. Again, school nurses can step in here being experts in that physical mental health arena and really be able to advocate for the safety of that child and the ultimate positive recovery for that child. Along the same lines, I would ask, has this child been accommodated? Um, have there been informal or formal accommodations provided? If not, talking with the team about what you all could feasibly provide and ensuring that those are consistently provided. If nothing shakes out in those first three questions, sometimes I ask, was this actually a mild injury? Um, many times I hear a child's had a concussion and they've lost consciousness for several days and were hospitalized. And so we can immediately start to identify that it really wasn't a mild injury. And if the answer is it was more moderate or severe, then it would likely change the interdisciplinary approach to that child. In terms of concussion guidelines, Maine does have a great concussion guide. Um, and I think Tammy is aware of that. So I'd assume many of our school nurses are aware of that resource, um, but I would put it as one of the top things to have in my toolbox and, and working with these kids with mild injuries or even moderate injuries who don't necessarily need um, complete medical wraparound supports. So in talking more about um, moderate severe injuries, many times I hear the statement, he was fine after his injury, but now his behavior is horrible. So usually I say, yep, yeah, we know that about kids with brain injury. We know that they usually make a very good acute recovery, but then have these challenges long term. So when we're talking about behavior, what actually makes his behavior horrible? Sometimes our teachers are incredibly frustrated when that supposedly typically developing child all of a sudden has these behavior needs. Um, and this is where I would question, is it actually behavior or is it something else? And so I would think about, is there a mental health concern that was provoked after the injury? Is there a cognitive challenge that is making classes really frustrating for this child, making them act out? Or maybe they have headache or fatigue that's irritating them throughout the day and provoking this behavior. Again, I would look at what accommodations we could trial informally and whether those do or do not work, do we need to move to formal special education services? Thinking about what team members might need to be involved and potentially thinking out of the box of who could be involved. And also asking the question, why is this happening now? Did something change at home? Did something change at school? Did something change with medications? If we can identify that trigger, then we could be better able to identify what actually makes that behavior horrible and better target that. Many times in our milder cases, especially with a teenager like David, we see some behavior challenges because of co-occurring mental health challenges that occur after a brain injury. Of course, there's other reasons to be seeing this, but many times that's the the top culprit that I can see in these teenagers. For our severe brain injuries, there's so many different co-occurring symptoms that could be related to this that I do really encourage that multidisciplinary team evaluation. And the last one, she gets so tired at school that she should just come for half days. So I suggest that the team consider the concepts of one, return to school versus return to learn. So when we think about return to school, the team is often thinking about kind of minutes in chair or minutes in the classroom, whereas return to learn is really the full engagement back into the academic material. I sometimes I would question what's more important for that child based on what their kind of prognosis is and what their academic goals are. So for some children, it might simply be important that they're at school full time. And if that is what the important piece is, then maybe we decrease those academic expectations so that they could participate, maybe with breaks and accommodations, but in their full school day. If the goal is return to learn, again, how can we accommodate this child to be successful learning 
And maybe it's setting their schedule up differently. But very, very rarely do I recommend changing of the school day just because of how disruptive that routine can be. I would ask the team, particularly the school nurses, how we could prevent this fatigue or tiredness. What are we seeing at home? Maybe at the night before, are we seeing um, complete nutrition being provided? Or are there other physical, mental health, cognitive challenges that we could work to accommodate? Again, looking at accommodations or some minor modifications before we consider modifying that entire school day. I'm going to hand the, this off and I'm gonna be advancing the slides for Katie. Um, and she's going to talk to us about the Brain Injury Association. Thanks, Jess. Um, so first we just wanted to share a few national resources that are well known for having some pediatric focused material that you might find helpful in your day-to-day -day practice. So Jess actually already referenced this first one, the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training. They are out of the University of Oregon, the Department of Psychology over there. And they focus on a variety of things, but they have materials, resources, um, you know, recorded trainings, et cetera, on things like the hospital to school reentry process, um, interventions to focus on improving social relationships for students who have sustained a brain injury, um, that transition from youth to adult services and more. So um, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at their website. Everything is nicely organized into folders um, and labeled, you know, resources for educators, for athletic trainers. So they have a wealth of information. Some of it is, of course, focused on the Oregon school system, but much of it could be adapted for your needs for sure. Our national office also has a website. Um, the brain injury page there has a lot of basic information and, and handouts on brain injury that you might find helpful. Uh, there's information on the continuum of care, more on screening and diagnosis, like Jess already touched upon today. Uh, we also have a community page with some great survivor stories, how to work on increasing awareness, um, the benefits of support groups. And we have a big education page as well with webinars, information on conferences. So a lot of great resources for professionals as well, if you're interested. And then one other national resource that we wanted to make sure that you knew about was Brain Steps. Standing, uh, standing for strategies, teaching educators, parents, and students. So on this website, you will see that it is focused on Pennsylvania and Colorado, but again, much of their material could be adapted for your needs. Um, again, they have some great general informational handouts that you might find helpful, especially about different causes of brain injury. Um, and they, I was taking a look through some of their resources. They have everything on how to like, implement the Brain Steps program to how to support an individual who uh, has been affected by long COVID sy symptoms and more. So great, great things to check out there. Uh, next slide. But now here are some main specific resources for you. So currently we are the main chapter of the National um, Brain Injury Association of America. And I've listed out here kind of the major supports and services that we offer. And so kind of the pipeline into a lot of the work we do is our helpline, uh, which is staffed by an information and resource specialist. This is a great way for people to get connected to our organization. And so this is available to answer questions, provide um, services that folks might want to look into based on their needs. When the INR specialist is speaking with someone, at times they are, are identified as an individual, family, professional caregiver who may benefit from some longer term, more intense support. And so then these individuals may be referred over to a neuro resource facilitator for, for some additional assistance. And I'll talk about that program in a bit more detail on the next slide. Some other things that I wanted to make sure you were all aware of, we hold an annual conference, usually in September. And for 2024, it is scheduled on September 30th at the Doubletree in South Portland. 
And um, we are hoping to have several presentations that are dedicated to the pediatric community. Uh, we host a resource fair every March because that is Brain Injury Awareness Month. That is typically held in Augusta and is free for attendees, professionals, caregivers, survivors, everyone is welcome. And we are always looking for additional folks to um, exhibit at a table. So if either of those, either attending or and or exhibiting at the uh, resource fair is of interest to you, please keep that in mind. We also put out a monthly e-newsletter, which typically contains a survivor story, upcoming events, upcoming education opportunities, and more. Um, I'm happy to sign you up for that if that's something that you're interested in. We have a very robust um, system of support groups here in Maine. Uh, we update that list regularly, and I, that is available on our website, but I can also send that out to folks if anyone is interested in that. We do have a few groups that are focused on um, specific needs or areas, such as a caregiver support group. We do have a statewide virtual support group that will remain virtual. So um, for folks who live in remote areas or attending an in-person support group is not an option. We have groups focused on stroke as well as a youth survivors network. Um, so we're you know really proud of what we have for our support group network out there in the state. We do a lot of education and training. Uh, every year we also update our resource directory, uh, which is pictured here. This is available um, hard copy. You can download it off of our website. I can also email it out as a PDF. And so we do update all the supports and services in Maine specific to brain injury and stroke every year. In addition, through our national office, we do have a family guide that is available as well as um, copies of their challenge magazine, which is a quarterly publication that focuses on different topics related to brain injury and stroke. I dropped my email here and we will bring that back up at the end of the presentation. If you would like copies of any of these things, hard copies, electronic versions, additional information, I'm more than happy to get that to you. Next slide. So neuro resource facilitation is a program that um, some folks may benefit from in your world. You might uh, be interested interested in referring families um, our way for this service. So it's an evidence-based program. And we really help people navigate the system of care after acquired brain injury. So our goal, goal is to really help them find information that they need, get them connected to resources, services, and supports, all focused on what are their short and long-term goals. This service is free for survivors and families, as long as the individual is a main resident and they sustained their brain injury after birth, they, they qualify for the program. Um, there's no cost. We do not bill insurance as well. Um, so when we work with someone through neuro resource facilitation, typically we begin discussing what are some short-term goals and what are some long-term goals. So with the pediatric population, that could be um, short-term goals, returning to school or a, a return to learn. And then long-term goals would be maybe it's enrolling in post-secondary education or finding um, gainful employment after graduation. And so we would kind of assess where the individual and the family is at now and kind of plan out the steps that we need to take to work towards those goals. So we will work with the survivor, family, professional, caseworker, you know, anyone who really is there as a champion for the survivor to identify resources to help them work towards those goals, will help them navigate the system, um, which can be complex and broken at times. And when we work with these individuals, we constantly monitor and adjust as needed. And then any outreach and education that we can do to help reach these goals, um, we, we are more than happy to do as well. Next 
Next slide, Jess. So just to give you an idea of how busy we are, I pulled monthly um, numbers for you going back through June of 2023. So right now we have three neuro resource facilitators on staff to cover the entire state. So most of our support is done remotely. Maine is a large state. And um, so mo most of our work is done over the phone, email, Zoom, et cetera. Uh, but here you have by month, the number of individual points of contact, the three of us amass each month. So you can see we are very busy. Uh, we tend to see drops during the summer and then around the holidays, those tend to be times where people are taking vacation or spending time with their families. On the next slide, I have numbers for like the actual number of topics or needs that we address with these individuals. So on one Zoom meeting with a family, we might discuss main care, we might discuss a waiver program through the state, caregiving resources, home modifications, and then other things that come up that we just count as other. So one individual might fill five or seven or 10 buckets in one call in one session. So again, we're, we're very busy, the three of us, and we know over time that we're probably going to need more folks on staff to meet the needs of all of our individuals across the state. Next slide. So just to give you an idea of some of our current projects, we are funded through a state contract with the Office of Aging and Disability Services or ODES. Uh, they fund projects such as our helpline, our community neuro resource facilitation, and we have a partnership with New England Rehab Hospital in Portland, which has started as a pilot in January of 2021. We also received uh, a, a grant through the Administration for Community Living and a Public Health Workforce Grant, which is funding a new pilot um, project with Maine Health slash Maine Medical, which is getting up off the ground as we speak. And then a lot of our ACL money is focused on our underserved populations. So we have a neuro resource facilitator who's really focused on working with our folks with co-occurring conditions because that's very common with brain injury as Jess already talked about. And we have three pilots starting up with three behavioral health organizations in the state over the next year or so, which we're really excited about. Um, and then our work with the pediatric population falls under this grant as well. And then uh, any other historically marginalized groups as well. So this work is really important to us and we're really excited to be making some progress um, as a staff. And that pretty much wraps up um, main based services. I'm going to stop sharing my screen as we answer questions, just so I can drop a link to the PowerPoint um, and to our contact information. And I'm also going to put a plug in that we are currently recruiting for um, a survey on childhood brain injury. Um, the answer is yes, you all qualify to participate in the survey because I am sure you've served at least one child with a mild injury in the last five years. Um, and we are sincerely just looking for general input from stakeholders in Maine that could work or interact with a child with a brain injury. So I'm gonna put that stuff in the chat and we're happy to answer questions. Thank you both so much for, that was just so much rich information and all of the resources that are available is really quite incredible. Feel free to come off mute if you have any questions or you can pop them in the chat and we can read them. Everyone's quiet today. Oh. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, do you keep tabs on the, the um, oh gosh, now I can't even think of the name of it, the, the head injury consortium that comes together 
and every few years around the SCAT assessment. So like it's a SCAT 5, SCAT 6. Do you know what I'm talking about? The concussion group? Yes. Yes. Um, are you talking about the state one? Or no, the, the national, national. No, international. international. Yeah, the international one. I mean, I, I keep tabs on it just because people ask me questions about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a specific question about it or just general information? Just just wondering, uh, knowing that that's a tool that, at least in the um, athletics and assessment piece of for schools, for school mm -hmm. nurses, that they would be told to use that, that some sort of tip... Um, like impact testing, concussion questionnaire type thing. Right. So some sort of assessment that is that is the same every time you do it. You know, a yeah. protocol for head assessing head injury, and um, so that would be one of those tools that people would use. Would be the SCAT. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So my recommendation for anyone using any of the symptom questionnaires is to one, think about how impactful those symptoms are. Um, so for example, we might have kids who have a headache after their injury for five or six months, but if that's their only symptom and not heavily impactful, that should not be the reason that we can't return them fully to school. And I would argue in some cases, return them fully to sport. Um, and so I always ask, ask people to do a little bit more digging around, is this actually a problem or is this just a symptom? And also asking, did this occur before the injury? So many of our kids are having concussions during those key periods of development where maybe they do have a history of migraine or headache. It might not be diagnosed, but they did have it regularly. And so it will show up, right? That, that symptom questionnaire is not always sensitive to identifying that change. Um, I think symptom questionnaires are find tools. They're quick, easy. People take them all the time, but asking a little bit more information around that and thinking across the team who, like, why are we seeing these patterns? I see Jean's comment. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say we have another, do you want me to read it or? No, I got it. I got it. So Jean said she sometimes struggles with a lack of diagnosis. They might've gone to the ER, school accommodations were not addressed. Um, but they score high on the SCAT or multiple symptoms. Any advice on this? If the child's scoring high on symptoms and it's having an academic impact, then I think moving right to that tier two level of support of providing those accommodations and also revisiting that return to learn guideline. Just because the child's out of that two week period or three week period doesn't mean that you can't restart the return to learn services. Um, with a lack of diagnosis, again, I think Maine is moving towards accepting, not needing to have a medical diagnosis to make that um, special education category. But for kids with those mild symptoms, I would really focus on restarting return to learn and getting them back to a baseline and building up from there. And yes, you can do that without a diagnosis because it's tier two support. Um, so you do not need any formal diagnosis to provide those. My argument to school teams is that if a child all of a sudden was showing these difficulties and maybe we didn't even know about a history of a brain injury, we'd be looking to support them anyways. And so it is just part of that general RTI model. Oh, and Emily, is that in the guidance? I believe it is um, where if, you know, you would make accommodations if there's a need it can be a perceived um, disability. It doesn't have to be a diagnosed one for, I believe is a 504. Yep, yeah. correct. And it is within special education law to provide temporary accommodations without even needing a 504. Good questions, Jean, thank you. <laughs> All right, anything else? I will also add, since we're probably all itching to get outside, um, Many people, as Katie mentioned, she provides education and outreach as part of her work in BIA Maine. Um, I also 
consult generally for free. Um, that's part of my position at the university. I have service built into my caseload. And so um, as you all start interacting with kids with brain injury, I'm happy to speak with you directly. I'm happy to speak with the team, with parents. Um, and I am always, without a shameless plug here, always looking for children with brain injury to participate in my research. Um, and I, I would really appreciate any connections, whether it's clinical or for research. So I'm happy to serve your teams as, as best needed. All right. Well, I will make sure that everything gets out to everyone that registered mm -hmm. um, for the uh, webinar today. Thanks everybody that was able to make it. And if everybody's okay with it, we can give people back what um, eight, seven minutes to get outside for a few minutes. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks, yeah, Tammy. thanks Jess and Katie for everything. Thanks. Okay.